So um, I think we can slowly start and um, say hello, good evening to our second evening lecture, Lasting Experience on Activisms, with uh, Joseph Ricard from H Architectures Barcelona. And um, maybe before I introduce you, I also again would like to um, stress that our, our old title is on activisms and with this title we um, would like to stimulate a discussion with you also among us what this could mean in our um, work as architects, as architecture students in order to become finally um, capable to initiate maybe own projects and at the same time become responsible for our built environments and that's why we wanted to assemble different voices with different approaches to also um, hear them how they approached um, arc activisms in their own work. I think reading your biography is sounding a bit like a modern fairy tale, mm -hmm. starting with um, four young architecture students working in the same studio in Barcelona, maybe sitting even in one studio becoming friends, sharing the same vision, and then they thought, oh, um, let's start our own office. Wow. And then it even worked out. That was 2000, if I remember right. And now, um, 20 years later, they have assembled quite a big oeuvre of private works, institutional works, um, widely recognized, and, um, but they're still sharing the same vision. And that's what I find quite important impressive. They, one of their visions is that they build maybe more spaces than um, programs. They build maybe more universal spaces which are independent from a specific function and which can always become appropriated anew and anew. And um, also they try to build, or not even try, they build with a minimum of materials. Yeah. And your um, energetic strategies maybe are generated more of the tectonics material than out of um, new technological um, strategies. You're explaining. Yeah, I, I, sorry, I just wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> but your oeuvre... I think enough. Yeah, yeah, just no, also no, saying describe that... describe it really well, thank you. That you are also... that this one has been recognized by uh, many others, like a wide public. Hmm. I mean, you have your own issue with Ecrookies and AU and you are teaching in Barcelona. Also, one of your partners is has having a teaching position at the ETH. And um, you have also won a couple of years ago the, the Art Prize from the Art Academy. Mm. So thank you so much for coming <laughs> and you sharing your work with us. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, I, I think Heike is scared because uh, it's like uh, more than 120 slides. So uh, I will try to make it as fast as possible. And there's a moment that we can stop everything and it's not a big deal. I will try to explain you a little bit uh, our general position. How this position maybe can be more understood through specific spaces. That idea, I like that idea of universal space in terms of in relation with something bigger, not just the human scale. And then uh, I will try to show you from one to five projects is up to you. So it depends on how tired you are or the time. So uh, not big deal. But just yesterday, it's, it's, I have some new stuff that I would like to show you because it's the first time. So and there's like four extra projects that I, I add to the basic PPT in order to show if, if there's time. Okay, the title, the idea of lasting experience is a little bit, is a little bit that idea of to synthesize our both uh, interest. The idea of, uh, we are basically concerned about sustainability, about ecological responsibility, and in that sense, the idea to talk about architecture as the project of the experience, I think that is closer to understand that we, as architects, we have to find out how to deal with sustainability, but by using specifically architectonical tools. So that idea is to talk about, in, my, in our opinion, is to talk more about experience 
than to talk about buildings, let's say. And last thing is the idea that we're trying one of our more uh, strong strategies in that sense is to make it as uh, large in time for use for people, for society. I think that is one very good sustainable strategy, not only to talk about embodied energy, but also to talk about how these buildings can last in terms to be reused, uh, change its programs, and it's not a big deal about that. I like to, talk, to begin with that, oh, let's see. Uh, this, this beautiful painting is about that basic idea about architecture in general. When we talk about vernacular architecture, we talk about that uh, common idea that architecture as something that provides people of shelter in nature. Not against the nature, not in front of the nature, but in nature. That idea that how architecture can provide us of protection by managing natural conditions, uh, physical phenomena. This is something that is uh, quite common to define like in that way the vernacular, the, 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 the popular construction and so on. But is our opinion. I think it's clear that it's not only in the vernacular that we can find out that kind of beautiful examples of how architecture and architects have provided of shelter people by managing natural conditions. Also in modern movement, also in contemporary architecture, we can find out beautiful examples in that sense. But it's true that in general, uh, architecture as part of society we have forgotten that relation, that awareness to be in relation with nature. We have forgotten that. We have come because of from the fuel uh, fossil era, we have come into that sense that there's an infinite uh, resources, there's infinite uh, energy. And in that uh, idea, during the last 150, 200 years, society and architecture as part of society has come into that into that uh, way to produce comfort through artificial uh, by being away from from nature by being on the other side of the glass coming to something that we call that at the end we are living in real fish bowls and this is not just about bad architecture i mean this is all architecture in general has come as part of society, as, so, as, as part of society that we are. We, have the, we, we, we share the same mistake, the same misunderstanding about what means availability, about what means the energy resources and so on. Uh, there's, something to, uh, there's something that is related to that, uh, that is that we have, we have, uh, we are in a misunderstanding too about uh, visual communication and experience. I mean, we have, and architecture also has come into that misunderstanding. I mean, uh, we live also in the era of the visual communication. Why? Because it's the fastest way to communicate. Is the fastest system of perception that we have as human being. If you, if you see, in this case, is the phase of more west, but could be. Marilyn, whatever, for just one part of a second, you will recognize the face of. But if you listen to the Ninth uh, Symphony of Beethoven for part of one second, you won't recognize that. This is a, a simple example about to understand how fast, how quick, how efficient is the visual system. This is something that, as we live in that uh, communicative uh, social uh, environment, we have give to the visual approach to everything uh, a level of, of importance that is because of the communicative approach. But in terms of pure experience, our way to, experiment, to have experience somewhere, so it's, it's an haptic experience. It's about touch, it's about uh, smell, it's about all that senses. That visual importance that we have given to architecture too, because we want to communicate architecture, we, 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 we learn architecture by, by a visual approach, has also uh, reinforced that idea of artificiality in, in architecture. Uh, even to the point that beautiful, nice, uh, 
um, great examples of modern architecture is, has been done by the proud to be completely artificial in the construction and production of comfort. Okay. Uh, we are not like that. I mean, we are, uh, we were a really lucky office. We have to say that. And we were lucky because uh, 17 years ago, more or less, when we began to be more uh, concerned about the, the ecological issue, about the, the ecological crisis that we live, because before of the financial crisis of 2008, in fact, the idea that there was a big uh, crisis of resources, it was already there. In fact, in the 70s, it was already there. So the, the resources crisis is far before the financial crisis. So by this moment, in 2017, 2015, when we began to be uh, more concerned about uh, the ecological responsibility, we were lucky in terms that because of the financial crisis, when we began to deal with real commissions, with real projects, with real uh, clients, uh, because of the crisis at this moment, it was not possible to, to our client budgets were too low to assume uh, solutions for uh, solutions for the comfort of the houses in terms of efficiency. And the fees were so low that we were not able to pay for sophisticated simulations. So this both, because of the crisis, we were not able to uh, deal with uh, ecological approach, but by using pure architectonical tools. I mean, efficiency, uh, efficient engines, uh, CFD simulations were absolutely out of our budgets, were absolutely out of our fees. So thanks to that, thanks to the crisis, the only way to deal, uh, the only way to be concerned with sustainability by doing architecture was by using architectonical strategies. Uh, first of, of these strategies, to manage the use of the buildings. How we use buildings is the first way to, to deal with, uh, with uh, with the waste of energy in our buildings by understanding that in a gym with kids is not the same temperature, temperature need than in a different part of the same school. So the idea of how we use the conditions that we really need in depending the use, it was one of the first strategies that we began to use in our projects or the use of low embodied uh, energy materials like the, the CLT panels. We were the first, it was like 17 years ago, 18 years ago that we used that uh, product that I know that it's quite common here, but in Spain it's really rare to use that kind of products. Or by introducing the bioclimatic spaces, the spaces that works completely passive, but not just because of that, but that assumes the unprogrammed, the, the unexpected, into the living day of a house. And when the active systems were necessary, when the active systems from the very beginning of the office in that, uh, in that context to be uh, trying to deal with the, with the ecological issue, when the active is necessary, we, we put from the very beginning all the systems into the elemental parts of architecture, not, not, uh, not giving that responsibility to the engines, not giving that responsibility to engines that manage with air, but by placing the systems in the structure itself, in the pavements, in the mass of the, of the buildings. So that's why I think that we were lucky, because we were not able to, to be more sophisticated than that. Then we discovered that, and what we like to do is to do architecture, to propose spaces, to propose experience, not to not to be the very best in terms of efficiency or in terms of uh, energy management and so on. Uh, now, it's, it's from that, it's the history of the, of the office and how we deal with, uh, how we approach to, 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 to the space experience, to the architectonical space experience. But now, so it's a large explanation or it's a large uh, timeline, but now we define that as a, uh, well, from the very beginning of the office, we haven't been a theoretical office. We've never did any kind of text, any kind of theory. We never write anything. Now that we get older and people ask for 
some matter to, to write something, you have to, to, to watch backwards and, and to see what has happened during these uh, 20 years. And now we begin to define some concepts like what we call uh, reciprocal architecture. What is a little bit, well, it's a, it's a fake scheme. It doesn't, it's non-scientific. It's nothing like that. It looks like, but it's our way to look more serious and more, <laughs> like more academic. But it's uh, try to recover that conscious about how much we need nature, how much we need uh, to manage the natural conditions, that physical phenomena, in order to try to, to go down in order to waste less energy and so on. It's impossible to come back to the pre-fuel fossil moment, but maybe we can come back to that idea of, of uh, awareness of nature. Uh, basically, we, we try to propose experiences through spaces, but we have learned by having experiences. And we have discovered that our best experiences has been uh, in that kind of places that we call interdependence uh, places or spaces where uh, the result of comfort is the combination, the collaboration between architectonical attributes and natural conditions. When this happens, the, the experience in architectonical spaces is stronger, is better, is more intense, is, and it's because you're feeling that something is happening that it's bigger than you. Uh, also, uh, in, in a complete different way, but I use also that painting to, to explain a little bit the same. This is a beautiful painting from a Catalan painter. I want to show you our best uh, from Catalonia, Ramon Casas, a very skilled painter. And I like this painting because it explains very nicely that moment of how comfort is the result of the collaboration between natural conditions and architectonical attributes, okay? But also because the title of the painting is an indoor outdoor. This is a real, for me, it's like a manifesto. The title is an indoor outdoor. It's fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, your explanation is better than mine and the title of the painting is also better than my own explanation. So it's the, our real manifesto is uh, the, that painting. What is, uh, I don't want to show you complete projects. I just want to show you some of these places of interdependency in our projects where I think that it's easier to understand that relation between, between uh, architectonical space attributes and this something that is outside, that is bigger than we are, and in this collaboration is producing the comfort experience. Those three aspects that I try to synthesize what is happening outside and it has to be coming to the, uh, put in relation with, uh, with architectonical space attributes is basically natural conditions and physical phenomena. Um, social context. And also the idea of, of, uh, of time. Well, uh, where for example, uh, we call that also convective spaces, spaces that um, emphasize, uh, provokes, and uh, through convection, through ther thermodynamics, a more strong, uh, of comfortable experience. Like in this case, like in a courtyard that works as a, as a, as a greenhouse in, in winter because the roof, the glass roof moves and covers the space so in winter become a greenhouse, or a, or a courtyard, a fresh courtyard in summer. Also, this other case, this is a, is not a, in this case, it's not an intermediate space, it's not a previous space, it's not a lobby, it's the sitting itself of the house, that again, as in a very vertical way, in this case, not because of the convection, but in order to get sun gains over the neighbor, the neighbor in this case is as, is as tall as uh, three stories, is really tall, is in the south side of the, of the plot, so uh, stop completely the sun gain possibility. So we decided to do uh, such a high sitting place in order to get the sun gains over the neighbor. That means that we have a 12 high uh, sitting, is a completely 
astonish space. I mean, I haven't seen it before in such a, because it's a small space. It's just uh, 25 square meters uh, sitting. It's not a huge, uh, a, a huge hall. But by, by doing this, we can get the sun gain over the, over the shadow of the, of the neighbor, which is in the, in the south side of the, of the plot. Then when you come into the house, the first space that you discover is that convectional space that is, a, is not only the, the, winter, uh, uh, the winter tool to get some sun gain, is also, is also a, a natural chimney that provokes the cross ventilation of the, of the whole house not by crossing to the street, which is a very noisy avenue with a lot of cars, but by producing that uh, convectional effect, that thermodynamical effect, in order to provoke uh, all the natural ventilation. It's not just about vertical thermodynamics, can also put in relation different situations in terms of temperature, then in terms of pressure, then also in horizontal you get that uh, cross ventilation. In this case, the idea of porch is also for us, not only our porches. We visited some fantastic spaces that are uh, again about that proposal to provoke a, an intense, a, a sharp, a strong experience based on, on thermodynamics. Uh, this is a porch that uh, is not just a porch, is, uh, is again a, a gallery in winter, a porch in summer, but is again the, we have, I have to say that we have fantastic clients. Okay, this is a, this is a house for uh, wealthy people, uh, really not poor people, that they assume that the seating was that passive, completely, pa the only uh, seating of this house. That guy assumes no garage for the car, he has a nice large Jaguar, and, and no other seating than the porch. So the seating of the house is a porch in summer and a, and a gallery in winter. And it, it not just provokes that natural ventilation, it's also uh, put in relation people with what is going outside, like that kind of gardening and so on. Or in this case, that the whole dairy program of the house is a complete porch. It's nothing else than a porch. The, the kitchen, the seating, the studio, all surrounds the, the bedroom's uh, block in order again to work as a as that kind of interdependence space that put people in relation with, with the outside, but not just the outside in terms of views, but the outside in terms of temperature, in terms of, of, uh, of comfort based on natural conditions. This, uh, very, in this case, is a really cheap house that uh, works with that kind of uh, metal sheets. And uh, it's cheaper to move the opaque part of the facade than to move the glass part of the facade. So in that case, the glass remains uh, in the same place is the opaque part that opens in summer and get closed in winter. This building, the, the whole intermediate space of the building works in a passive way getting advantage of the, of the huge amount of inertia, of mass, that has that very heavy structure in order to, to produce, again, a, a thermodynamical strategy based on how inertia, how mass helps to uh, make softer the average of temperatures between day and night and between summer and winter. The whole intermediate space of this uh, facility is a research center. It has no active systems. It's completely passive. And it's, uh, we are proud to say that it's never under 17 degrees, which is it's, it's completely under uh, norms in Spain. But uh, by having also good clients and convincing them, sometimes lying them, uh, they have discovered that there's not a big deal to have that kind of intermediate spaces at 17 in winter because people just with a jacket have nice meetings. They prefer to have meetings in that kind of intermediate space than in the meeting halls. And in summer it's never over 28, which is not uh, the best uh, temperature possible. But when you feel that this temperature is not based in artificial systems, but in natural systems, your body the adaptive psychology of the body in front of natural conditions is far better than when the conditions is based in artificials and you can feel it by yourself in your car 
or in a train or in that kind of uh, closed systems that when the artificial doesn't work, the uncomfortability is infinite. Uh, well, uh, I know that Le Corbusier is from Switzerland, isn't it? But we've never liked it very much, that idea of modular and the human scale. and uh, We feel far better in our own experiences when we feel ourselves in relation with something that is far bigger, than is climate, than is uh, physical phenomena, and like is time. When you have the feeling of the time of the things, the time of construction, the time of the heritage, or the time of the performance of the building, is again uh, that kind of, of interdependency between architecture and that something bigger that is happening outside, and you make it coming into the human being experience. Uh, time, time is about, of course, memory, time is about how we deal with heritage. Uh, in general, our position in front of heritage, we've done a lot of uh, heritage projects, uh, competitions or private uh, commissions. Our position in front, of, in front of heritage is always to ask, uh, I will do a Louis Kahn uh, sentence, to ask to the heritage if it's still able to perform in the behavior of the new building. I mean, are you still able to work in a, structural, uh, in a structural way? Are you still able to help to the indoor comfort by helping with inertia, with mass? I mean, I, in our opinion, that's the best uh, homenage that we can do in front of heritage before to uh, recover the compositional values, the cultural values. That, of course, is also part of the dealing with, with heritage. But first of all is to uh, reuse it again in terms of pure architectonical behavior, structural behavior, uh, um, comfort behavior. But uh, this, is a, this is a facility in Barcelona and equipment is a, well, doesn't matter, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a school for adult people. But also time is about the performance of the building. The, be the building behaves. A building has to behave. That's what we try all the time, to use the building in terms of uh, uh, as architectonical uh, object to behave. And when you make feel that natural behavior to, the, to people, you're also making them feeling that concept of time because, because the air moves, because the temperature changes, because the light is changing. So, Time comes into the experience also, not only by that idea or that conventional idea of heritage, but also by that idea of, of uh, natural behavior of the building. In this case, that building works uh, completely natural. I mean, uh, it has hardly a, a heating pavement for winter extreme moments, but the rest of the year, the building works basically by natural ventilation but not cross-ventilation, because this is classroom. So in terms of classrooms, you know that natural cross-ventilation is not really comfortable, because you listen to the other classrooms, you listen to the streets, and so on. In this case, the, the air moves from the, from the streets through the underground, through a very, uh, uh, through a basement, and then into the courtyards, cross the, cross the classrooms, and then goes up. In this case, well, this basic thermodynamics is very simple. There's a lot of other people in that classroom, so in winter you don't need nothing else than move the minimum of air. In summer you have to do the opposite. You have to move like uh, 15,000 uh, volume meters of, uh, of air in order to take off the excess of heat of people. Okay? So that's uh, thermodynamics, very basic, a lot of inertia, a lot of mass thanks to the structure, a lot of ventilation, and so on. So we did that, we did the simulations, more or less. It, but the challenge in this building was not only to put uh, inertia and natural ventilation in order to produce the comfort, but that the engine that push or that moves the air in that building is also a natural engine. This is a sun chimney. The, the, the guilty of the movement of that 15,000 volume meters is that that pyramidal uh, shape uh, chimneys that is in the roof, that is the rainproof system of the building, but is also the natural engine that uh, pull up the, all the air that, and from this pulling, 
the air comes from the cordial cross and goes up. Well, in this case, this is far it's not uh, so long time ago, so we were able to pay for simulations because uh, it's not so, it's not, uh, at the beginning of the office when we won our first competitions, uh, the, 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 let's say the, the typical teacher or the typical architect, our kind of colleagues that are from previous generations, they deal with that idea or that uh, idea that we have as architects to be concerned about the ecological issue by talking that all this idea of uh, natural comfort was basically common sense, like in the vernacular, white walls, cross ventilation and so on. So with common sense everything is enough and is absolutely untrue. I mean, now when you are assuming that kind of challenge is not enough with just common common sense. It's necessary to, to, to get help from, from engineers in order to do that kind of sophisticated simulations in order to really design that natural tool is a natural engine but is completely sophisticated. I mean it's nothing just like to understand from where the wind comes and so on. That's the, that's the courtyard in the north facade. That's the classrooms that is crossed by the, by the movement of the air and that's the sun chimneys that pull up all the air from the classrooms. Uh, when I talk about that idea of social context as that third idea of what happens outside that we want to come into the put into the put in collaboration with architecture in order to produce the experience, uh, social context is about basically about history too but especially about resources what is available, what is there, what is going on, what people know to do in a, in a specific place, uh, what's the traditions in terms of construction, what are the materials available in that region and so on. Uh, this is a house that we did, um, that it's more or less a funny story because uh, this is a beautiful village in, La, in Lampurda, which is a really beautiful region in Catalonia north, close to the sea and so on, the kind of old villages with walls, uh, stone, a lot of stone. In this case the, the plot it was, it was not built, it was just a huge amazing stone wall surrounding a plot that used to have an agricultural uh, issue, you know, a huerto, uh, well, like garden. garden. Well, uh, the idea in that case was so simple because uh, Perlow in that kind of old village, very uh, delicate facades and so on, you have to, you have always to build, even if it's new, you have to, will, to build the new facades just in pure stone. Doesn't matter if it's not the structural, it's just, in a, it's just a question of, of urban landscape. Okay? So it was so simple to propose a house attached to that uh, former wall in order to use the pre-existing wall as the pure facade of the, of the house. The problem, uh, and so we place the house on the, like a continuous succession of cells attached to the, to the pre-existing wall. But the council was planned in the council that the wall has to be demolished because the street was too, too narrow for the cars to to turn the corner and so on. So it was a big crisis at the office, the wall has to be demolished and so on. I'm talking about that because this is about resources and also about heritage. The heritage in this case was a wall that is not uh, protected, is not in any catalogue, but is still, even it has to be demolished, it has still have attributes enough to perform in the new house. So in this case what we did was to, to demolish the wall and to use the stones in order to produce a combination between, between the traditional rammed earth uh, working in this region but with an idea of cyclopic concrete, a concrete made just with lime, just with that big stones from the former wall, uh, but place it like in a rammed earth uh, technique. Okay? So uh, we, we, do, we did this in, in layers of 10 centimeters one after the other placing the former stones, the bigger stones on the structural, uh, more uh, on the heavy behave of the, of the wall, the lighter stones up and combinating this with uh, 
with uh, glass balls with insufflated air that work as, as, as an insulation of the wall. This is only possible in Catalonia. Don't try to do that in Switzerland. It doesn't work in terms of insulation. But in our climate, it was enough, okay? I, even in terms of low. I mean, it, it's into the norms, okay? Uh, well, the, the funny thing of this is that the former stones of the wall were replaced more or less in the same place, working more or less in the same uh, behave, okay? Uh, managing the size of the stones in terms of a structure and also managing the, the stone, well, that's the, the house, it's, uh, it's like that. It's the same scheme that at the beginning, I mean, the scheme was the same. It was the, the same house but attached to the former wall. Now is the same house but with a new wall. It's a just one layer wall house. I mean, there's no insulation layers. There's nothing else that a pure, uh, a pure a structural wall, 60 centimeters wide, uh, that can behave as a structural and also as insulation and protection. Uh, well, this is the other side. It works as a pure greenhouse. This is a weakened house. I mean, there's no heating in that house. But as is a pure greenhouse, uh, south orientated, in winter, when they arrive on Friday, the house is warm. Okay? On Sunday, when they come back to Barcelona, the house is a little bit uh, colder. But. Uh, but this is, the, this is the process by reusing the stones with that lime mortar, okay? Combinated also with some uh, soil to give the color of the place. On that. And this is the final uh, moment when in order to produce that kind of normative facade that has to show the stone, we dig uh, over the surface in order to recover the, the former stone and to be into the law, okay? Just in, the, just in the windows, because of the rain and the water, uh, we, the, the lime mortar remains to protect because it's a delicate corner. And, and we, so here you can see the geometry of the former wall, the beautiful landscape of that streets, uh, the kind of wall that it used to be here and how we rebuild it by managing resources. This is a new example. This is something that we're building in Mallorca is a dwelling for old people, for elderly, and is a, little, is a, is a similar story about uh, manage, uh, managing the resources and how resources and how materials can be part of the experience of that, uh, of that experience of the, into, the, into the space. Uh, is not uh, finished. I, I just want to show you that uh, specific uh, relation with the, with the resources. Here, the resource, this is in the middle of uh, Palma de Mallorca, you know, uh, Balearic Islands, uh, used to be a school. Okay, in Mallorca, they have a beautiful, uh, not tradition, but it's just a pure, uh, a pure uh, circumstance. Uh, it's cheapest, or has to be, it's been cheaper till 20 years ago to build in stone than with bricks. Okay, they have that kind of lime, of limestone uh, that we call uh, mares. It's a beautiful sand uh, stone, very easy to cut. And they have a lot of quarries in that sense. And the traditional construction, even with the thin uh, walls, it's been done with that kind of a stone. Okay, so the whole uh, former school uh, that was in the plot is, is built with that. So, and in this case, the idea was to demolish, the, to demolish the, the school, to demolish the walls, to keep the, the stones, to keep the mares. And with the mares, in this case, in the same place of the, of the, in the same plot, at the end it hasn't been possible because we have need more logistics, but the idea was to demolish and with the demolition produce the, the this is a public uh, commission, it's a competition, it's, it's uh, promoted by the Balearic uh, government, okay? And they are so proud that they, they have proposed this competition with the idea that the, you don't have to build as much as the norm let you. So you have more space than what you really need. So instead of doing bigger garden, let's say, or bigger, or bigger, uh, a bigger building than than the program is asking for, we decided to do as big walls as possible, okay? As big as possible, as huge as possible. Not just because to waste space, 
but because the most mass you put into the into the space, the best work the thermodynamics. Okay, so well, I mean, in in Barcelona it's very simple to understand that concept. I mean, we live close to the sea, so our average of temperatures during the year is softer in winter and is softer in summer. If you compare it, 100 uh, kilometers coming into Catalonia. Okay, why? Because the uh, the specific heat temperature of the of water and the amount of water that we have on the sea help us keeping the excess of, of hot in summer and giving back to the city in winter. Okay, so it's the same idea. But as we don't have the amount of inertia that gives us the sea, uh, we have always to combine that kind of strategies with natural ventilation because you have to keep out at night that excess of heat that the uh, massive part of the building has kept during the, during the day. So it was not just a pure uh, snobism or just an artistic position to do the biggest walls as possible. It was in order to put as much of mass into the building as possible, okay? And to work also with geometrical, uh, the structure works just in pure geometry, okay? So it's bigger at the bottom, then it gets a little bit lighter in order to give a geometrical support to the slabs that is made with CLT panels. So, well, you, it's, it's like uh, a little bit bizarre to see such a wide walls, but it's just for that uh, thermodynamical reasons, okay? And, and, not, and to get that natural comfort. It's not finished, maybe at the end it's terrible, but by the moment, <laughs> but by the moment, uh, uh, we have uh, developed that strategy of, of uh, producing we do that kind of pools, uh, of casting pools, where we place the, the rocks uh, with, again, a lime mortar, okay? And with a, with a machine that it's from a quarry, they have rent a, like a cutting machine from a quarry, and we cut the blocks just uh, in a very simple way, okay? So, yeah, it's really beautiful. I mean, well, it's, it's a, it's a cool uh, building process experience. Okay, so here we are storaging the blocks. The, the beautiful is that when uh, producing like this way, when you cut, the stone shows up again, like in the house, a little, in a different way, but you recover that, that image, uh, the color, the texture of, the, of that lime sandstone that they have, that we call mares. And now we are standing up the first uh, plan. And we, we, you know that uh, amazing French uh, architect, Gilles Perrodin? Well, it's, it's an amazing architect. He works with real stone, not like we do. I mean, but the technique to place the, the blocks one over the other is pure stone technique. I mean, with just lime, uh, lime uh, mortar to, to refill the, the joints and, okay. Well, I think I'm doing in a good rhythm. Okay. This was a little bit. This is my position. This is the some examples of places of interdependency where we try to combine architectonical attributes with natural and physical phenomena, with time and with uh, context. Okay. I tried to do it as using, of course, our own uh, projects as examples. And now I would like to show you some complete projects, okay? I will try to do it uh, not, not, uh, not, too, not too large, okay? Um, this is a winery. Uh, I show you this one because in terms of pure thermodynamics is the biggest invention that we've done. Well, the sun chimneys was, uh, was uh, quite an invention, but, but this uh, winery where the comfort is designed not for people but for wine. Uh, we've, we've tried again to put that strategies into this building and we've done a, a new, we've done something new that is, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, this is in the south of Catalonia. We have a region, we call it El, El Priorat, Priorat, El Priorato. It used to be maybe the worst wine in Catalonia. Okay, but for 30 years ago, uh, 
One guy from Ribera de Duero, another region with very good wines, uh, that from a very rich family involved with wines, he was looking for 10 years in all Spain, the perfect place for the wine that he has imagined. Okay? And he discovered that the former, the, the old-fashioned way to produce wine in this region, in El Priorat, it will fit very well with, this, uh, with his idea of wine. Okay? Originally in El Priorat, the wine was produced in completely sloppy uh, uh, landscape. I mean, they didn't change the, the section of the, of, the, of the mountains in order to get it uh, more, easy to, to, more easy to produce, more easy to be managed, uh, better to, to keep the humidity on surface with this steppy section. So, in the old-fashioned uh, way to produce wine in this region was just pure slop, uh, very dry. So that guy, Alvaro Palacios, discovered that maybe by recovering this way, this old-fashioned way of producing, uh, he was sure that uh, with the kind of grapes that they have here, he will produce the wine. And it's like that. Now El Priorat, I don't know if, if it's famous, but it's the expensive wine that we have in Catalonia for sure. And the one he begins was, the, was that guy, Alvaro Palacios. This is a commission from a Switzerland guy. He's a doctor, uh, he's a surgery, and he's really in love with wine. And he has decided to invest in that. And he's, now he's not a doctor anymore. He's completely involved with the, with the wine process. And he bought, uh, with some partners, an existing uh, vineyards and so on. But he wanted to build the new uh, winery to produce the new wine, okay? With the old grapes, but new wine. And he discovered, and he's very sensible in that sense that he discovered that as this is a very poor region, the former, the old uh, wineries are not, uh, didn't was like big buildings in the middle of the landscape. In these regions, the wineries were always uh, familiar business, very small business. So the wineries are always into the towns. So in the basement of the houses used to be the production of the wine uh, till now. So in that idea, it was his decision, not ours, to build uh, five plots in the middle of, of Gratallops, which is the name of the town, just close to the church, in order to, to put the new winery in the old or the traditional position of that kind of business, just in the middle of the town. So. Uh, the, the norms here is that's the that's the silhouette the, the frame of the of the five plots this is the corner in front of the church and the norms ask uh, like that to be a specific distance from neighbors this is a partition wall that divides separates us from the neighbors so this is the this is the norms we decided to do that we, in order to divide very clearly the logistics and social part of winery process of wine production which is this from the real production that means the batting rooms and the cellar okay so we did a very logistical a very infrastructural very uh, efficient building in order for the pure production of wine and the rest the combination of this uh, euclidean geometry with the partition wall, this intermediate space has to become the logistics, when the grapes arrive, when they do the bottling, uh, and whatever. But the logistics in wine, it's just a couple of weeks in autumn, a couple of weeks in spring. So the rest of the year, when it's not about logistics, is the social part of the winery, when you can be received to do some uh, to test uh, the wine, and so on. But it's, a comp it's, a, it's an outdoor space just covered by a pure roof uh, it's not an indoor space. Oh, sorry. So that's the section with the former, with the former wall, with the former partition wall, with the batting room, the cellar, and the intermediate space that works in that sense. Which is something that we. It's also a little bit about some stuff I've been explaining that uh, by by using not only the geometry but also the, materi the material of the partition wall, that former wall, you're also explaining, you're, you're 
not explaining, because this is not about explaining. I mean, uh, architecture experience is something that happens to us as can, uh, the same way that happens to my mother or to my brother-in-law. I mean, we're just human beings having experiences. I mean, to explain architecture is something that we can do in architecture school and so on. But, but what we are trying is to design the experience. And this experience is always based on that combination of pure uh, design decisions and that something else that sometimes is history, sometimes is available materials, sometimes is thermodynamics. Uh, well, that's a batting room with some offices and so on, and this is the intermediate space. Well, uh, I, I want to show you the, the interesting part. Uh, it's beautiful. This is also about is a lime mortar, because we try to do it just with pure bricks, which is our, let's say, uh, firm the plumed the no, well, firm the our office. But the council was completely against the idea of bricks. Uh, so we, we developed that, uh, that lime, very, very thin mortar that doesn't hide the texture of the bricks. And it's very transpirable. It's, it's, very, it's from its natural pigment. It's, it's really beautiful texture. Okay, so that's the intermediate space, which is like that. Okay. But the interesting part happens inside. Okay, and our our challenge here with the client with the, with the client was to produce a space that was the whole year between 18 and 24 degrees. Of course, that nowadays I don't know if you know about that, but uh, wine productions, the batting, the bats of the wine productions are always into artificial conditions of temperature. Okay, but if you put that kind of bats into a space that is in a regular average temperature without active systems in terms of wasting of energy, in terms of uh, not for the wine itself, because the wine will be because of the temperature of the, of the machine. Okay? But if you put that machine into a space in a very regular temperature, I mean, in terms of, of economics, is also important. So our challenge was to get into that average of temperatures between 18 and 24. To get there, we did again the same strategy as always, to put the biggest amount of mass as possible into the space. Uh, like producing like a mountain, like a cave. Okay? I, I, have you ever been in, no, I suppose not. But uh, if you never visit Granada, if you visit the south of Spain in Granada, there's a still a couple of neighborhoods where you can visit people who live in two caves. Okay? And they don't need air conditioning, they don't need any artificial machine. They are under 17 and 28 uh, from winter to summer because the mass of the mountain uh, protects and mm, makes that the temperature remains into that uh, very comfortable average. So this is a little bit the same. But in this case, we did that strategy to divide the walls, the structural walls, into a lot of, of walls in order to produce not only a lot of mass, but to produce a lot of surface to do the interchange between the mass and the ventilation. Okay? Because basically what we try is when the outside conditions are okay, we produce uh, cross ventilation, but when the, the outside conditions are not all right, we close the building, it remains completely closed, and then that mass uh, makes that the, the, the indoor temperature remains uh, as used to be. So we did that. Uh, ta, ta, ta. Uh, this is the construction process. Okay. And this is not only something that happens in the walls, also in the roof, the beams supports also walls with a lot of holes, with the same brick put on vertical position, the air also cross through the slab structure. Okay, well, the invention here, okay, the, the, the smart idea, let's say, which is the extra. The extra has produced that we are not under 24, we are under 21. So the building is always between 18 and 21. El Priorat, I can promise you that in, in summertime is about 40 degrees. I mean, it's really hot. We are in 21 degrees, 21, sometimes 22, 23. And this is thanks 
to that extra that happens here. It's not only about uh, mass, it's not only about natural ventilation. In that case, we've tried this. This is a pool okay, with, a, with a 20 centimeters layer of water. During the night, the water is here. Okay? So, as in thermodynamics concepts, we lose, we interchange energy with other masses, you know that. Okay? So, in front of what mass we lose the most energy possible? In front of the sky. Okay? That's why uh, we protect our, hat, uh, our head with hats, or that's why if you go to Morocco, or people in summertime try to sleep on the top of the roof of the buildings. Okay? Because in front of the sky, you are better than just in the street. Doesn't matter if it's outside. Because there's an amount of inertia so infinite that you lose a lot of energy. Okay? So during the night, we put the water here in order to make it as cooler as possible. Okay? And during the day, the water falls down to this chamber. Okay? And the water is so cold that the whole structure uh, get into that temperature, okay? and it's so cold that we have, and we have checked it, we have, uh, we have achieved that the air goes down. It's, it's amazing. It was after a simulation, we did simulations about that, of course. I mean, it's not, it's again, it's not just common sense, because it's nothing less common sense than the idea that the air can go down. I mean, the air tends to go up. So, uh, and it works really well, and this, this is when we did, the, there's uh, structural bins here, and this is the walls with the brick put in vertical position in order also to move the air through the structure and to put the air in contact, in touch, with the, with the fresh of the water, okay? This is a, a fake picture because it's during day, daylight, so the water should be in the under chamber, okay? Well, you see that the village is beautiful and the colors and so on. I mean, there's of course a lot of, uh, let's say, pure design decisions to talk in architecture. So I'm just talking about thermodynamics. It doesn't mean that we are not uh, concerned about into, that, into the same strategy, you can do thousand different solutions in terms of uh, geometry in terms of whatever and we do that checking process I mean we do thousand different solutions we meet every day we meet every week comparing solutions but the strategy is what uh, is more easy to explain not the decision of an office of people I mean uh, when I was younger when I was at school uh, it was typical that kind of lecture when uh, where, where, uh, famous architect come to you and explains you the smart idea of a building by using a section, by using that kind of drawing that he did uh, flying to Paris to talk with someone important, so that kind of beautiful drawings. Of course that there's always a smart uh, section in a building, but, but this is about the personal approach to the project. What is more interesting to share, what is more interesting to explain is the strategical aspects of the project. This is a batting room. And, okay. and here, this is not for people, but you feel, but the, 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 comfort, the comfort feeling is the result of the combination of the collaboration between architectural design and physical phenomena. Well, this is the project, okay? It's eight o'clock. Do you want three more projects, two more projects, one more project? It's up to you. I think one or two more projects would be wonderful. Yeah? Everybody agree? Okay. okay. I, I'll, I'll go fast because it's not prepared. I mean, I've just took yesterday or the day before the pictures into the PPT and it's like that. I have a question. How does the water change? It's a pumping system. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we are not so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To, to go up needs the pumping system. This is a house. I mean, it's, it's uh, just to show you beautiful pictures because there's not big strategies, there's no big, big ideas, but the house is quite beautiful. And, well, I think that is a, one of the concepts that I, 
I really, but not because of the architectural that we practice, but because the places that we've been before, that has given us that previous experiences that make us that clear idea that the, the how important is some parts in the in the experience when you are into an architectonical space, and one of these is that the architect uh, uh, architectonical buildings become more uh, convincente, uh, more liable, more liable, uh, more convincent, uh, especially when the experience is based on attributes that are placed on the very basic and elementary parts of construction. What I mean? Well, now I came from the Jean Nouvel building, which is pure, let's say, coating, pure dressing. It's, and I, I came 20 years ago before uh, here to visit that building, especially for that building. I loved by that time, and I still think it's quite interesting. But, but the experience is not based in what is elementary and basic and really important in architecture. What are the two elementary parts in architecture? A structure that supports uh, people behaves and uh, envelopment system that protects people behaves from outside. So that's elemental, that's always there. This is very elemental. We really believe that when you ask these elemental parts to perform not just as a structure and not just as a rainproof system, when it's performing as a structure, as producing comfort, as, as dealing with, uh, with program, as we're dealing with all, then the experience becomes more convincing. Well, in this case, this is a house that is just a pure structure, okay? The windows is because of the structure, the space is because of the structure, of course, the comfort helping to the inertia and the mass is, is because of the structure. This is a former house in the center of Barcelona. And, well, it's, it's quite simple because it's a family. We decided in this case, in terms of, uh, of uh, a strategy of program, to, to give uh, one floor to, for, the, for the parents and one floor for the kids and one for, floor as common program. It sounds simple, but thanks to that uh, simple idea, you get privacy in section. You don't need other walls than the pure slabs in order to separate uh, the programs and the users of the house, okay? So we hardly need any other wall than the pure slabs because here is for the parents, here is for the kids, here is the... So thanks to that, the plan is basically open, the FNOs, there's no uh, other walls than for the bathrooms, which are just on close attached to the, to the partition walls. Um, this is a bricks-based structure, everything. And in this case, very high spaces, it's nothing special. It's just that the, the house that is really tall, uh, as tall as possible, um, we've done this decision that because as these bricks, the structure is based on bricks, and it's very thin and it's very uh, um, weak because it's a very svelte, very thin columns, we've done that cross shape to the pillar, to the column, in order to make it more stable. Okay? So that decision that is about the structure, so is an attribute of the structure, produces an experience in terms of pure geometry. So it's something that you get through the sea, through the, through the ice, but it's really more intense, more beautiful, more strong. So uh, we have uh, dissolved the typical structural wall into that very thin columns, uh, more stable with the cross section, and really just with the structure, I mean, the experience on this space is really strong and beautiful. The windows is just a pure gap between the columns, and so on. The facade is the same, I mean the facade is just a pure structure. Uh, and well, I, I love that house. There's not much to explain about that. <laughs> how, how high are the, the ceilings? Not, I, I mean, it looks really high, but it's uh, 360. Yeah. But you know, the most beautiful thing that I can explain of this house the, the structure is completely new. I mean, the former house, it just remains the facade, okay? And the volume that it was necessary in terms of low to produce that section. 
but the only former part of the house is the facade. The rest is completely new. Okay? But the beautiful story is that one day the owner was opening, coming into the, into the house, and one neighbor coming across in front of the door and watched the image inside. He was a little bit in love with that. The owner invites him to come in. And his question was, what cabia uh, antes? That means, what was the previous, what was the former building about? I mean, his sensation was that was something pre-existing. That the, this is something that uh, is not just because the structure is giving that sensation of uh, industrial former space. Is that when, uh, the picture doesn't let you sh see that is the brick with just pure lime painting? Okay, you you see the texture and so on. When you see that convincing part of the structures, you have that feeling that you're getting something that has some time. It's not just the time of something new, of a new house. It's the time of the brick that exists before the house. It's the time of the construction. It's the time that you're feeling that something has happened there before the owner comes into the house. I think, it's my opinion, that maybe that's why that guy has the felt, has the feeling that it was not just a new house, it was something, what was here before, what, or what was happening here before. Well, that's a night. Well, the, the, the staircase, as, as, the, as the program is diaphanous and is one floor per, 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 per profile, then it's possible to place the staircase in the facade. That protects you from the noise. I mean, let's say that, that the program of the stairs, that is a beautiful space, also very vertical, also protects you from the, from the street and again works as a natural chimney, producing the natural ventilation. This is a, a building that we finished. It's a, a renovation of an old industry. Uh, well, it's an industry with that kind of section, very typical. Uh, in this case, it's interesting, I think, I mean, it's, it's again, good clients, nice commission. It's always, it's always very interesting to deal with that kind of industrial spaces, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's like the typical loft, that idea of New York, I don't know, that kind of huge, a lot of uh, volume meters. And it's a luxury, for sure. But the problem with that kind of industrial spaces, we know the typical problems. Low insulation, too high, so the temperature, I mean, difficult to manage with climate systems. But the most important thing, it's very difficult to place uh, jerarchical programs into that kind of industrial spaces. I mean, this is offices for a pharma industry. Okay, So it's people working in teams, in departments, in different groups. So how you place that kind of groups of people into that kind of spaces without doing the typical box in box? So that's the challenge in that building. Uh, the, the, what we did here is to, to produce that kind of what we call tribes, because they, are, they call themselves like that. It's a group of departments that, are, that have some synergies together. They call themselves tribes. So every tribe has his own cluster. And this cluster, it's that kind of uh, CLT panel clusters around gardens. So the intermediate space is completely passive. It works just by the making better the insulation of the building, by producing new systems to produce cross ventilation, a lot of uh, mass in the pavements and so on. And it's just climatized this surrounding and, and, uh, and the combination of the geometry produce this, these spaces that also works as meeting rooms. And the whole year are again between 16 and 28 Okay, and into the into the offices just with a heating pavement, they are also quite well. Okay, we just finished this. Uh, there's other spaces because there's, but it's less interesting. This is the part, the administrative part of the former uh, industry. Uh, we've just demolished everything in order to do a welcoming area with this uh, with this depression. Uh, the, the, tw the 200 people of the offices can be seated all together in this agora. Uh, it's just the, the former structure with some reinforcements and, well, it's quite simple. But the interesting part is that, that idea of cluster. And the cluster, it, no, it, it not just happened in the offices part, it also happened 
in the distribution in this distribution space you come from the welcoming part to the cluster to the concrete cluster and from the cluster you can go to every one of the CLT clusters then you can cross it's very clear and this space is really is really beautiful is a zoom talk copy of course you don't have to say it you don't have to ask it I mean, well, and I think uh, I led the two other projects for the next publication, if it's all right to you. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs>
we also have, let's say, clients outside of Mediterranean culture to appreciate uh, your work? Uh, uh, excellent question. I mean, I don't know if we are able to do the same in different uh, uh, climate conditions. But, I mean, our strategies are not just about the use of the mass and cross ventilation. It's about the use of physical phenomena <coughs> and natural conditions. And natural conditions and physical phenomena also happens in Switzerland, in Norway, everywhere. How we will be able to use these different conditions in order to introduce them into our space design, I'm not sure. But there's two different, I mean, and it's also about the kind of office that we are. We are a small office. We met together at the very beginning when we started and so on. And we've been always absolutely concerned about construction. Our only challenge when we were young was that what we were designing, when what we were designing has to be built. And we want to check that and we want to follow that process and so on. So to live 30 minutes from our buildings is, is the most happy can happen to an architect, in my opinion. So for us, it's terrible the idea to work abroad because it means that at least the construction process is really difficult. Okay? But it's also true that it's impossible to win the perfect competition every year in Barcelona. So if we want to do the same kind of buildings, we have to do, maybe we have to move a little bit. Okay? In fact, the dueling I've shown you is in Mallorca, which we have to have a, we have to take a flight to go there, which is something a little bit uh, scary. Okay? And, and now we are developing a, a project in, in Antwerp, in Belgium, a big, big project. So with different strategies in terms of, of thermodynamics. Let's see. I don't know. Uh, uh, we really not. Uh, I mean, our perfect dimension in terms of office is that 30 minutes car for, from any any site, from all the. And in fact, our experience is about like, uh, that average 30 then minutes. You do site supervision. Yeah. Do you kind of do the yeah. site management? And that uh, these buildings are not big are not huge buildings, it's not skycrapers, it's not a hospital facility. So the, the following of that kind of buildings can be assumed by a small office. But it's true that also it was also another lucky dimension of the financial crisis of 2008. In 2010, when we were in Barcelona, we were in a terrible moment, no commissions, but we were lucky because we won two competitions. We developed the projects and we began the construction. Our decision at that moment was not to fire anyone from the office, but put two people of the office, add to one of the partners, into those construction process of these two competitions. And this was also a change in the dynamics of the office, to discover how by controlling the most the construction process, you get also new discoveries, you, you, you discover new options, new, uh, a lot of new things happen. So yeah, we, we do all the management, managing of the, not, we are not managed, we, we don't manage in terms of financial or in terms of economics, we control it a little bit. In fact, we were so proud because we were one of the only offices in Barcelona that we did our own, ba not budgets, but uh, what we call mediciones, that means, that means to do all the least to write the whole building. So we really try to control all that part. You had a question. Yeah, I have a, a simple practical question. Because you have a lot of these uh, chimney spaces in, in your projects. And I did understand that it worked like with ventilation, like the whole air is going up and down. I also understand that like in, in winter it worked like a winter garden with the sun coming in. What I would be interested in is, in, in summer times, how do you protect the, the glass roof from the sun? In the... Well, the, the sun chimney, the, the most extreme sun chimney that we've done, which is in the facility, this is a pure sun chimney. That means that that machine just take off the air from inside the building to outside. But this is not a real space. In fact, there's a huge insulation 
between the sun chimney and the building because in that case as we have to move so much air the inside of the space is about 90 degrees in summer so you can die there okay so when the invention is so so extreme we put uh, like uh, 40 centimeters of insulation between the sun chimney and the space that is being managed like this okay but in that kind of houses uh, it's just uh, it's very uh, that's why we use uh, prefabricated windows that has his own shade system in summer okay so and and we do other sometimes if the orientation is good sometimes we don't put that kind of protection but we open the window in opposition to the sun that produces also a sun chimney effect that it it becomes really cold i really hot so, sorry the glass becomes really hot and then that helps again to put off the 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 air and is this as it's so so uh, away from the pavement the radiation of the object doesn't arrive downstairs yeah. Yeah. but i have to say i mean it's it, it it works quite well but it's not perfect i mean this our projects you have to assume that in winter you need a jacket and in summer you need to go i mean you won't be like in your bank office uh, waiting for a meeting i mean and this is something that in terms of social culture no not everybody is able to assume that and our clients and that's why it's very difficult in our case to get new commissions that we are very not uh, we we always do a lot of meetings with the clients before to accept the commission in order to see if they have they will will be really able to assume that kind of a forge soft forge i mean i'm not talking about to 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 live in a nightmare but to to assume <laughs> that very basic that means that in summer is hot and in winter is cold i mean something so so but it's true that again i have to assume that uh, barcelona surrounding not barcelona barcelona is becoming is coming into a dangerous situation because it's a very dry city, very black city, so the concept of heat island is coming more and more dangerous. But the surroundings of Barcelona, I mean, it's a very good area to work if you are able to manage with the Mediterranean climate. Mm. It's really, it's not a huge challenge. How do you deal with policies, like also, I think, in Switzerland and also in Germany, the policies, policies are, guidelines are quite strict? But the, for me, the difference between Switzerland and uh, Germany, we've done some competitions and we've, we, we worked in Will and Rhine, in, mm. and mm. we've done some stuff abroad uh, in order to notice that how difficult it is to work in front of the norms in Europe. No. The norms in Spain are basically as tough as difficult the difference is that in the rest in spain that concept of certification of due diligence is not still so strong as in the rest of europe what i mean that the problem for me in germany is not about the norms or the policies is about the insurance the checking process the due diligence that have to be done by the promoter by everybody even by the constructor that means that it's very difficult to introduce the invention into the design. So this is not possible here, but not because of the law, but because of the due diligence. Mm. And in Spain, the idea of craft work is still, it's not excellent, but is still uh, enough to develop that kind of simple inventions in construction, but uh, our projects, uh, I mean, are completely, we are absolutely concerned about laws, norms, policies, fire departments, policies, and everything. But I, but I tell you that what I've seen that is softer is about that uh, checking process because of certifications and insurance. Mm. Um, <coughs> thank you very much for the talk. And, and I think it was a, a symphony of, of brick and maybe uh, a little ode to the uh, CLT, uh, and, and, but it all is, is really about construction, I guess. Uh, uh, I mean, you started with the vernacular and came to quite sophisticated kind of positions in that. 
Um, and I was wondering, just because we we're in an educational institution, it's like, how did you, what were your interests, or how did you get the knowledge about construction? Or is it teachers? Is it teachers? Well, like visiting? There's, a, there's another big difference between Spain and the rest of Europe. In Spain, we don't have uh, civil engineers. Okay, so uh, uh, when I studied, and right now it's not exactly the same, but architectural career is six years and final project, which is a couple of years more. So you are like seven years of studying. There's a lot of engineer uh, knowledge. There's a lot of uh, structural calculation. There's also calculations of systems. We are not engineers, but we have a more or less not a deep knowledge, but a general knowledge of everything. So, but this is because who goes to prison in Spain is the architect. So, so the, the assumption of that means that architectural schools in Spain are completely professional profile. So our studios, and I think that yours are more or less the same, but, but our studios are completely, that I play as the students are a professional. I mean, our way to project in the studios are as making the game or making the fake that you are a professional, that you are developing a real project into real conditions. Why? Because, and there's another difference. In Spain, who gives you, who allows you to, to design real buildings is the university, is not the professional uh, association. This is a completely, so university has a big responsibility because the next day of the final project, they are able to sing everything, a hospital, so and they are not ready <laughs> for sure, but, but the institution, uh, because of these two things, uh, is very orientated, very concerned about that idea of what I call professional simulation, okay? It's not enough, but, uh, but our reference, our teachers, our model is very based in that you're not an academic designer. You're someone who will have to control a real constructive process. And, and at the end it's like that. Well, there's no architects in prison in Spain. Don't worry about that, <laughs> but, but should be. <laughs> Some of them. So what, what would you, maybe last question before we give you a beer. <laughs> um, so w what would be your advice for not only Swiss students, but also um, Swiss faculty to, to um, maybe as a last comment, to learn and to how to act, how to behave? Well, I have a lot because I love to talk, I'm sorry, but, and I have a lot of advices, a lot of ideas, but I just remember one that is not about the profession, it's just about the pure student. And I don't know if it's something that happens to you. But what happened in general to my students, and now I am in the last year, I'm in the final, in the professional master and so on. But even with that kind of more mature students, they still have that terrible, uh, uh, they, they are always scared about the white paper, about the idea that design is something that has to be completely new, completely create, that a building, that a park, that uh, whatever, is something that has to fill a white piece of paper or a black screen of the laptop. My advice is the, that there's nothing like that. I mean, and I will use a famous or not so famous history from Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank, Lo Frank Lloyd Wright, during the anniversary of one of his best friends, as he was Frank Lloyd Wright, when the friend arrives home at night, he discovered that all the furniture of the house has been moved from one place to the other. Frank Lloyd Wright has decided the good way to place the furniture in his friend's uh, house. Uh, the moraleja, or the story of that, is that architects just move things from one side to the other. So you don't have to do anything new. You have to move things. So the first step in any project is to discover what is already there. What is already there in terms of stones, in terms of people, in terms of uh, social dynamics. 
I mean that half of the work is as simple as to be aware, as to be uh, registrando, uh, documenting. checking, documenting what is already there. And when you discover that, you become the most happy student in the world. <laughs> because suddenly, just by finding out the perfect, elegant way to draw a real stone, wow, you, you enjoy a lot. And, and this is an advice that I always give to my new students. Yeah, good advice. I have more advice. <laughs> <Let me. laughs>